Now we're going to talk about how to do the simplest kind of model fitting, linear regression. We start with data that's approximately linear, and our aim is to find the line, that is the coefficients m and c defining the slope and intercept, that is the best description of all the data points. First we assume that the data is described by the function y of i is equal to f of x of i is equal to alpha xi plus beta plus epsilon i. xi and yi are our data points. The terms epsilon i are the errors. They represent the deviations of the data from the straight line relationship caused by some fundamental variability in the system itself or something like measurement error. Usually the errors are assumed to be independent as well as identically and symmetrically distributed around zero. We can make the more restrictive assumption that they are normally distributed with fixed variance. This means that all the data will cluster roughly the same distance from the line, usually within one or two sigma. Given some values for the parameters, we can calculate the errors. Epsilon i is equal to yi minus alpha times xi minus beta. The squared error of the model is then q alpha beta, which is the sum over all data points of the squared epsilons. The goal of least squares fitting is to find the values of alpha and beta which minimize this function. This is actually possible to solve analytically by differentiating the error function with respect to alpha and beta. Differentiating with respect to beta allows us to solve for the intercept term. I won't go through the derivation in detail, but it turns out that the intercept is given by solving the equation of the line using the average values of x and y. Differentiating with respect to alpha allows us to solve for the slope term. If you want an exercise, show that the second line does indeed follow from the first. The formula as written here looks a little like the correlation of x and y. In fact, we can rewrite it in terms of the correlation coefficient. We do a trick where we multiply the numerator and the denominator by the standard deviation of y, and then use the definitions we learned in the previous lecture. Again, if you like algebra, pause and make sure you can follow this. When we simplify, we get rho times sy over sx, where rho is the correlation coefficient from before. Put simply, the slope of the line of best fit is equal to the correlation coefficient times the ratio of the standard deviations of the x and y data. We can substitute this back into the original equation and rewrite it to show that the correlation coefficient is the slope of the least squares fit to the standardized data. This hopefully helps you to think about the relationship between the correlation coefficient and the slope. The correlation coefficient quantifies the strength of the linear relationship, that is, how much like a line the data is. It applies to the standardized data. The slope tells us how much we expect y to increase for any given change in x. It applies to the raw data. Saying the slope is big doesn't tell us how linear the data is. A large value for the slope parameter could just mean we're using some small units, centimeters instead of kilometers, for example. Likewise, a high correlation doesn't tell us how much y should change in response to changes in x. It only tells us if the change causes an increase or a decrease. While we can solve analytically for a one-dimensional linear fit, generally it's impossible to do this for more complicated functions in higher dimensions. For this, and even for linear regression, you want to use a library implementation, for example SciPy. The SciPy module LinRegress takes x and y values and returns several useful numbers. First it gives the slope of the regression line and the intercept of the regression line. It also gives the correlation coefficient, as well as the two-sided p-value for a hypothesis test whose null hypothesis is that the slope is zero. Finally, it gives a standard error of the estimated gradient. We'll talk more about parameter errors in the next video. Standard linear regression makes a number of assumptions about the data, mostly about how the errors arise. The language used to describe these concepts can be very mathematical, but in essence they all describe fairly simple ideas that can easily arise in practice. The first assumption is linearity. The most important assumption is that the data is actually well described by a relationship of the form y is equal to m times x plus c. If not, linear regression is not applicable. The next assumption is exogeneity. This just means that the x variables don't have any errors, that is, we know them exactly. This is often violated, but if the x values are known much more precisely than the y values, then this violation of assumptions doesn't cause too many issues. We also assume homoscedasticity. This means that the errors in each data point, the epsilons, have the same variance regardless of the value of the data point. This assumption is often violated, for example, with income. If we estimate someone to have an income of £1 million per year, plus or minus £20,000, it's extremely unlikely that, following the same procedure, we would estimate income, someone's income at £20,000 per year, plus or minus £20,000, giving them an income somewhere between zero and £40,000 a year. What's much more likely is that we make an error roughly a constant percentage of the total estimate, for example, a 2% error, so that the person makes £20,000, plus or minus £400,000. If the variance is not constant, the data is said to be heteroscedastic, and a naive linear fit might not be completely correct. Another assumption is independence. The error should be uncorrelated. That is, a large error at one data point doesn't imply anything about the errors of the neighbouring data points. For many types of data, but especially time series, this is often not true. We also assume full column rank. 
This means, for example, we can't have two identical variables and we can't have more parameters than variables. This one's usually okay if there are more than two data points. Often, the more restrictive assumption is made that the errors are normally distributed with width independent of the data point. If your data set violates one or more of these assumptions, and almost all data sets will to some extent, you should think carefully about if the violation is significant, and if so, you need to use a different technique or to transform your data.